Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Dunn along with Tanya Rogers and we want to thank you so much for giving us a little bit of time tonight and we want to thank you for joining us for this discussion on hidden bias. Many of you may have just watched a inspiring show, uh, a program on WPTV called Hidden Bias of Good People. If you were not able to watch it, we are going to be able to re-air it tomorrow. I'll give you those details coming up in, in just a little bit. But Tanya, I know you took a workshop of Dr. Marks before, and uh, he is a captivating figure. He definitely is. He's very interactive. And if you did watch the broadcast on Channel 5, you probably realize that um, you could almost talk back to the TV and kind of go through the motions. And if you had someone sitting next to you, probably talk to each other, but he's very interactive in his workshops. He had many of us um, answering and the answers he would have on a big screen and we could all see it. And we saw that many of us had similarities. No matter what our backgrounds were, we had certain things that we agreed or disagreed on. And some of the comments are already coming in from some of you uh, on Facebook. So thank you so much for weighing in. We're going to encourage that throughout our roundtable discussion tonight. Here's a recap real quick of what Dr. Bryant's presentation entailed, kind of boiling it down. Implicit bias is defined as unconscious attitudes that affect how we think, evaluate, and behave. Our exposures and life experiences shape our implicit bias. Implicit bias can make you act both positively and negatively toward others. We want to introduce now some impressive community leaders who are joining us tonight to continue this conversation and to really get in and talk about it. Because as we heard so often throughout the program, when you know better, you do better. And I think this might have been a real aha moment, as Dr. Mark said at the very beginning of the program, for so many people. So let me introduce our guest for you tonight. Patrick Franklin is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Palm Beach County. Welcome. Maricela Torres, Executive Director of the Esperanza Community Center. Thank you so much, Maricela. Maha Ekolali, an attorney and outreach community chair of the South Florida Muslim Federation. Welcome. And Josephine Gahn, Vice President of the Jewish Community Relations Council at the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County. Welcome as well. And to our very own colleague, Todd Wilson, uh, one of the uh, fine reporters here at WPTV. So again, thank you all so much for being with us. Let's get into it. And uh, oh, here's Jones that's weighing in. If you all, I know you can see it on your screens as well. It was very interesting. I enjoyed him, the way he taught. I wish he was one of my professors, exactly, because he teaches that more Morehouse College. I agree. I was thinking the same thing. Like, man, he would have been like one of the best, you know, that you ever had in college. Okay. But I, I, I was going to say, Kelly, I think one of the things that stands out about Dr. Marks is that he says, he doesn't say, hey, you need to change. He says, hey, I'm the same way too. So I, I think he tries to make sure that he's relatable. And I think that makes it even more interesting to listen. I 100% agree. And let's begin with that, Tanya. And that would be kind of the big takeaways from this Hidden Bias of Good People program. And uh, Patrick, let's begin with you. What did you, after watching that hour, what are the, some of the things that come rushing out after it watching brought, that? It brought back memories. It, it brings back um, the daily activities that we go through each and every day. As an African-American male growing up, in the, in the deep south, it, it, it made me feel uh, right back to where I was. Um, his picture of what a what people think of a young black male was spot on. Um, no matter if you were black, white, or whatever, we all harbor some of those thoughts, but they're incorrect when you get to know a young black male. So, um, you know, there's a whole lot there. There's a whole lot to unpackage here. And kind of, you know, when I, I I was struck when he was talking about it's what you're exposed to since he teaches at a predominantly African American male school, he said, What I see when I see a black man is totally different than what some other people might see. And again, it's that kind of conditioning that is is unconscious in, in many cases. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um Maricela, let let's let's uh, throw it over to you. What what was your takeaway from tonight? 
that was one of the most powerful examples that he um, used was he showed a picture of the his college graduates with the honors cords. And I thought, I love that. You know, first, I was so impressed that we're all male. But that was one of the biggest takeaways for me is that we are conditioned by our surroundings. So the same thing for me. I am used to seeing a lot of Latina women who are professional and, and just independent women. And so when I hear stereotypes about how we are meek and submissive and we are uneducated, I always think like, where did that come from? That, that's not my reality. And that certainly isn't the reality of some of my friends and colleagues. So definitely, um, it, it really struck the point. That was powerful. Absolutely. Maha Ekalali, uh, what did you think when you watched? It was definitely re relatable as far as, you know, perspective is everything. And that we're constantly having these associations that are, you know, built, established and built upon and deeply embedded in us. And, and we're, we're reacting to situations day to day based on those associations. And many of those associations are just simply inaccurate. And he was just so successful at pointing them out and he was you know, blunt, straightforward and to the point. And maybe that's really how we need to deal with these issues. Like this is the association that's been made. This is the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation and you know, exposure and, and breaking down barriers is everything. Blunt and to the point for sure, but in such a way that uh, you know it was it you you wanted to hear it, and it was not just calling out someone and accusing them of this way you are, but but saying hey step back and look this is something that that most people who live in society and breathe experience. I, I just thought that was he just the way he gets the message across was in incredible. Josephine, uh, what were you thinking? So I, I agree with you. He's charming and so wonderfully presents the case. And I, you know, that br brings you in and, and makes you feel less threatened perhaps. Um, Cause I think for a lot of people, the sort of the, the concept, the conversation, the topic can be, you know, people can get on the defensive. And it led me to think a little bit about words that are used um you know the truth is we do all bring these are experiences this is how we function in society and in the world it's, it's our defense as well is is what we bring to every situation um but it's it, it's i wondered about words and I, I thought you know bias is a strong word is that perhaps the best word perhaps stereotypes a better word and then i thought well as a Jew, there were implications for me, and I started to think in terms of what does this whole conversation mean for Jews? And uh, so it was good. It was very good and very thought-provoking um, and certainly worth, you know, hearing. Uh, Jeff has been commenting quite frequently and said that he hadn't planned on watching uh, because she says she was not brought up with bias, but he drew her in. So we know he was captivating. But, you know, I wonder if, if the whole point of it was that everybody is kind of brought up to this on some level. What do you all think? I have to agree. I think that everyone has bias, but I think the interesting thing that he made, the point that he made was that you don't have to stay in that bias. Mm -hmm. You can, The more that you are exposed to people, especially on a positive note, you can move beyond that. I, I think that's important. Tanya, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree too. And I think too, when you, um, when you get to know people of different walks of life, you feel more comfortable around them. And I think sometimes that helps when you're dealing with the biases. You know what I mean? Because it's like getting to know the person, the core, their heart. I think that is tremendous. Yeah. Let's take some time and have each of you kind of talk about the hidden biases that you've seen directed at members of your community or at you in particular. And that's something we want to ask those of you at home as well. How has hidden bias impacted your life and your community? Who wants to take a stab at that first? I can, I can speak to one. We spoke earlier about it. 
before we went on here. Um, an interesting situation that has happened with me. I've worked in markets from Cleveland to Orlando to Minnesota uh, to here. And the one thing that has, has been a constant throughout my career is I would go out to do a story with the photographer and I'd have my notebook in hand and my pencil. I'd have a hat or a jacket that said the station I worked for. And we'd start talking to people and they would ask me, and they would ask the photographer, well, when is the reporter going to show up? And I was, you know, but at one time I didn't know how to respond to it because I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, well, I'm here. And then my photographers would see that they would start to just point directly to me and say, he's right here. Um, you need to talk to him if you want to try to get this story together. So that's a bias that I've faced throughout my career. Yeah. And so, Patrick, what do you think about that? Is that just representation? Is that is that just people who for, for many, many decades never saw a, a black reporter or yeah. an anchor person on TV or, you know what I mean? I mean, represented out in those fields? Yeah. Kelly, we are still dealing in an age where we're still seeing the first black reporter, anchor, um, band leader, uh, orchestra, whatever you want to call it. We're still seeing so many firsts, even in our day and time in 19 and, and, and 2021, we're still seeing the first, okay? The first to achieve this, the first to achieve that. So if you have never seen that before, how can that happen? Okay. So we we all we always try to teach our children and expose them to all these different variations, but they are still trying to uh, wrap their arms around the first of, okay? And even within our children's generation, they're gonna still have the first of going forward. So how can we expect others who don't look like us to accept that we have reached that level? You know, if, if, if they have never even seen that before. So, you know, in, 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 in terms of defense, uh, we see it all the time. Uh, how can that? How can that young man right there with dreadlocks be a lawyer? Okay. How, how can that happen? That's not. That's not, that's not what a lawyer looks like. So when 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 we look at all these different biases that that go on, we have to deal with it at so many different levels that, from a minority perspective, we understand it, but others don't. Mm -hmm. And. You know, I would say, Maha, what about with the Muslim community? Yeah, for uh, our community, yeah, for our community, it's layered, you know, because Islam is a, a religious identity. But within Islam, there's huge diversity. The population is so diverse. So, for example, if you have an African-American Muslim, that's two layers of bias that you're trying to overcome. Um, for me, as a Muslim woman, who's an attorney, I've had all kinds of situations happen. I mean, I've been in line at the courthouse, full suit and a briefcase and been told, you know, this is the attorney only line. And, you know, just trying to deal with this idea and this perception that Muslim women are uneducated, that Muslim women are oppressed, that Muslim women are, you know, made to wear their scarf and forced to wear it. Um, modesty to me is my empowerment. You know, and, and my education is the ability to empower others and, and to advocate for others. So this idea that Muslim women are oppressed is such a foreign concept to me personally, because entire Islamic history is about empowered women, women who carried this faith financially, women who were business women, women who were educated, women who passed on knowledge. I mean, it is all about empowerment. So there are so many misconceptions about Muslim women. Um, and the other idea is that all, all Muslims are Arab, which is also false. 20% of the American Muslim population is, is African-American. Um, and it's the third largest religion in America after Christianity and Judaism. So the misconceptions go on and on. And we won't talk about you know this, uh, this idea that Muslim men are aggressive and, and, you know, that's just not a reality. And it's something that they have to overcome day in and day out, this preconceived notion and, and people judging them um, and, and just misjudging them. So it's an interesting journey. And, and you know, with the change in uh, the atmosphere more recently, it's really forced the community to be a little bit more um, visible 
to the outside community, become a little bit more politically involved, a little more socially involved. So it's almost a, a blessing in disguise because it's pushing us to say, listen, you need to know a little bit more. And it's an opportunity to educate the public. But this idea that Muslim women are oppressed is, is often a bit comical to me because we are definitely an empowered group of people. Mm -hmm. Maricela, what about the Hispanic community? What do you think some of the hidden biases are directed at members of your community? Yes, so I work with um, migrant day laborers in the North End, and for a lot of um, our community, right, the community tends to be isolated in the shadows it's this perception that the majority of them are undocumented, that they are here from some keeping government and they don't qualify for them. And that we're just having babies and looking for a check. So we both have this stigma um, and, and they're, they're, they get defensive about it. Mm -hmm. I personally have always faced the question of what, you're Mexican? I, I had no idea. My God, you don't look like you're Mexican. And I always wondered, well, what does that mean? You know, until I finally asked, well, what does that mean? Because I wanted to understand that. Mm -hmm. My parents are Mexican. I was born in Mexico. So this is what a Mexican woman looks like, like me. And then I, it, I, I knew where they were coming from, but I wanted them to see what they were saying, right? I like certain and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think that they themselves needed to face their own bias, right? And I also needed to accept that the majority of people, that's all they know. That's all they've ever seen. And that maybe there's an opportunity to say, well, I am Mexican, my parents are Mexican, and this is what we look like. We have blonde, blue-eyed, um, brown, all, all shapes for people. And I think that, that when people start seeing that, that's when, when attitudes start to change. But in our community, I think there's a lot of work to be done in um, integration with the rest of uh, our neighbors. And, but there's things to be from you know, cultural, language uh, barriers and so on. We're going to get to some solutions right after this. I want to get your thoughts, though, um, Josephine, about um, bias Jewish population. Right. Well, so it, it, what both Maha and Maricela said are also apply here. You know, we are also it's layered um, and it's nuanced. And just as she said, the Muslim community is not monolithic, neither is the Jewish. So you know, we have, you know, the perception, and this goes to the, the bias, you know, is that all Jews are white and all Jews are European uh, Ashkenazi. It's not true. We have black Jews, we have Asian Jews, we have Middle Eastern Jews, Jews of color, you know, the whole the whole gamut. And, you know, for Jews of color, they, they are facing an, an added for the, we also get, I got it, you don't look Jewish. Well, what does Jewish look like? Um, and these, the, the whole notion of bias and stereotype is the very essence of what we face in anti-Semitism, is it's, it's, it's stereotypes that have become tropes that have become conspiracy theories. And, and they are deep and they are, you know, millennial, uh, been going on for millennia and, and unfortunately still with us. And then we have the, the visibly obvious Jew you know, and the non-visibly obvious Jew and the Jew who dresses in orthodox garb and who is easily identifiable and easily targeted. And I imagine that's the same in the Muslim community in some ways. It's the, the visible out, outerwear of, of the religion. Um, so there, there is that. Um, there is also the problem we found, though, with this whole discussion about bias and race is the denial of the Jewish experience. Because people are judging, you know, this has become a racial conversation instead of, I think, a uniform one about all the biases we hold about each other and one another. Um, there's this dismissal of Jews as white and therefore white privilege and therefore white supremacist in bizarrely, I mean, bizarrely. 
um, and that because you are white, assuming if all Jews are white, you haven't suffered. Um, and there's this complete denial of, of anything that we experience. And I think that's just as dangerous a reaction when trying to, to sort all this out and to look at how we think and, and how what is behind our motivations and how do we respond and how, how do we behave. And it shouldn't be at the expense of somebody else. And it's not a competition. This isn't a, you know, who's oppressed more. <laughs> this is about how we see each other and the, the biases or the stereotypes we bring to it. And I think that needs to be that needs to be remembered because it's it's very much the, the Jewish experience now is not understood well and and at times we feel what have we done? You know, why are we excluded from this conversation when we're, you know, Jews are, are as a religion in, in hate crimes against Jews is the highest of all religious groups in America, by far. You know, when it comes to race, it's African-Americans. When it comes to religion, it's Jews are victim of, of crime. So something is something is not being acknowledged and, and one wonders why. So let's, so let's, get, let's get into the solutions. What do you think people can consciously do on a day-to-day -day basis to change their thinking and to help reduce uh, some of this hate, some of this bias toward across the board, you know, everybody. Uh, Patrick, you, let's begin with you. What well, do you think can be done? One of the things, one of the uh, easiest things is to look through the lens of a black person. And, and I'm going to talk from a, from a black perspective. Look through the lens of, of what a black person sees as they go through life, as they go through trying to get a job, trying to get a loan, trying to start a business, okay, uh, trying to get... Uh, uh, get money to go to school, whatever it takes. Look through their lens and try to understand their struggle. And, and if, if you can just find a little ounce of, of, of what they're going through, you might feel their struggle. You, you might see what, what they see and the pain and, and the issues that they see. Because when, when I look at racism and white privilege, they kind of link together, okay? Because Dr. Mark said that Racism is a system, of, uh, a system of advantage based on race. Then what is racism? Okay, but look through the lens of a black person to try to understand the black experience, and and I think you will you would just get a little bit of the feeling and educate yourself more on that. Todd, what would you have to add to that? What do you think? What do you think things people can do consciously every day to help change? I think it's tough for me. From my experience, it's tough for people to see through a black person's lens what they experience. But I think the best thing that they can do is get out of their comfort zone and meet as many different people as they possibly can so that when they see it, if they notice it, they'll be like, okay, that's that aha, aha moment of, all right, I see what, what this person is going through and all I right. know it's not right. Now, if they want to take it a step further, then they can say, hey, that's not cool. You need to stop that. I just think it's very hard for someone of a different race to see through another race's eyes what they're going through. But when they see, they see they say aha, when they get that aha moment, because say I'm something. sure everybody gets it. Everybody yeah. sees it. They're not blind to it. All but right. I think it's more that people need to really experience other people and genuinely do it. Don't do it just as an experiment or just for whatever. I mean, genuinely say, hey, I want to get to know this person. Let's go out for coffee. Let's talk. Maybe there's a friendship that sparks. You never know. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kelly, I wanted to say something that um, that was brought up is I think when people see me, you know, they just assume, you know, African-American. And then when they get to know me, they realize actually my parents are Hispanic. You know, I have roots back to Puerto Rico. I have roots back to Panama and Central America. And then when I speak Spanish, some people are shocked. They're like, oh my goodness, she speaks Spanish? How is that even possible? You know, and I lived in Central America for a few years. So I think it's getting to know the individual and realizing, you know, I mean, I even have Italian in my background, you know, from my grandfather's side. So it's, it's we're, we're kind of a melting pot. And, but it's been great because it's, it's opened me up to different cultures. Mm -hmm. And it's also opened me up to who am I surrounded by? My friends, my closest friends, they all look different for me. And I love that. 
Mm-hmm. Hey, I remember when you were Tanya Cruz before you were Tanya Rogers. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how far back you and I go. That's for sure. Right, exactly. <laughs> Maha, let's get into some solutions and some some tangible things people can do. What do you suggest? Okay, I think honestly, it's just going back to the basics of remembering each other's humanity, you know, and and it's, there's this process of dehumanizing groups of people and making them less than and this justification of abuses of those groups, based upon these, these, um, these associations that are created in our mind, it's just going back to the basics of remembering our humanity. And I know that Josephine and I have talked about this where you'll see situations, for example, where the Jewish cemetery was destroyed and the Muslims came together and raised funds to try to assist in in fixing that that vandalized um, situation. And there are situations where mosques are burned down and guess what, the synagogues open up their doors and say, here, do your Friday prayers in the synagogue. It's just this mutual respect and maybe crossing barriers. And when you see that a group is being abused or a group is being, um, there there are injustices against groups that are outside of your circle to say, hey, we are here and we will stand with you because this is unacceptable. So it's just going back to the basics of remembering our humanity. Such a great point. And folks at home, if you have any specific ideas you'd like to share, please do so. We're not excluding you out of this conversation. We're talking about ways to reduce that bias and to change attitudes. Josephine, do you want to dovetail off that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's beautiful. And I think that's it. It's a combination of what everybody has said, which is not our humanity, but also getting to know one another. You know, when you know someone, you can't hate them you know, as much, maybe you can, but now you know why, right? instead of an assumption. Um, but you, it's, it's knowing, it's, 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 it's making that connection. And I think if, if nothing else, thinking a little bit after following this, this uh, presentation by Dr. Brian, even if a cause wants to stop for a minute and think about mm-hmm. what am I thinking, how am I behaving, or how can I change behavior? I mean, just that little consciousness, I think helps. And then again, as Maya said, it's about we've all got to be in this fight. You know, um, we we got to help one another. And we've all got to stand out against, stand up against injustice, and intolerance, and hatred, and ha- anti-Semitism, whatever ism there is. You know, one group can't be fighting it alone. So we need we need to all all stand up and say this isn't acceptable. This is not okay. And I'm here for you, and you're here for me. Um, so I think that's, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really the key here. And we've got to keep reminding one another of that. Right. So that's a great point. Maricela, any specific things you think people can start thinking or doing right now to change things? One of the examples that Dr. Bryant used was the inclusivity at our places of uh, work, right? We claim that we are inclusive and so on and so forth. But he mentioned how we tend to sort of isolate ourselves into our own groups. I found that very interesting because I think it's true. And until we have the courage to step outside of that, we will continue to just reinforce our own belief system and not um, have the joys of meeting others with different ideas with that share different world views and food i mean there's so many th- different things that we all bring to the table and i know that my life is richer because i have friends from all walks of life mm-hmm. and i exactly. think that one of the other points that he made that really struck um, me was you know watching that that, that news um show that you maybe would never watch because it goes against your own belief system. And I know for me, I I feel very strongly about certain um, shows and I won't do it. And I thought, I I need to do that. I need to do, do that in order to also understand where this group of people is coming from. Right. right. And not always reinforcing my own belief system by watching those things or movies or shows or right. music or people that 
align already with my worldview and my way of thinking. That's a good point. Even our Facebook feeds, all the algorithms, you know, start steering us toward what we tend to go to online, that sort of thing. Todd Shoemaker has such a nice comment and he recommends we listen, we can ask questions. We get to know the people, Todd, like what you were talking about, get to know people that look different than us and help build that beautiful community. Um, we have about 15 minutes left in our discussion. And I, uh, I think we wanna leave people with some hope and for future generations. And when it comes to becoming more accepting and inclusive of various groups, and actually Nicole just wrote in right when I was saying that, she says, I have young children. I'd love your thoughts on talking with tomorrow's youth. So how do we take this as adults and realize, okay, I've got to change, but I've also got to teach this one the right way. So let, let's go around the, the, the table again. We'll, we'll begin with you, Patrick. What do you think? Well, we we have to teach our, our children that, that that it's okay to to uh, work, talk, play, and engage with others who don't look like them, yeah. and and really do it in in a way that is is safe. And don't be afraid. Don't just don't be afraid. Take that step, and especially after we get out of COVID, and we and we get into a, a, a back to where we used to be. But you know. Tell our children it's okay to engage with others and and let them learn. And if they bring something back to a home that that you observe and correct them or or help guide them, but let them learn what others are are, are doing. I mean, I I've enjoyed having my children learn from from others. Um, my oldest daughter, when she was in high school, uh, we would host the high school parties at our home because we were just like, okay, I don't want you out, but bring them home. Bring them to my house, yeah, yeah. And we would actually have, we had so many different friends that it was unbelievable that, that came around, but our house was open to them and said, please come and have fun here. And we learned from them just as they learned from us. And um, I think if we, as we as parents can do that with our kids and expose them, let them go out, they will bring back and tell you what, what they've learned. I, I'm sure Todd and you probably meet a, a lot of young people who who say, "Oh, I want I want to go into TV or whatever." And you know, what do you recommend? You know what? I'll tell you this. Uh, from my experience, I always told my kids to always treat everybody equal, uh, and that has stuck with all of my kids, which I'm really happy. Not to say that I'm the perfect parent or not, but I always tell tell people, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, mm -hmm. and. So far, I can say that my kids have done well. In my house tonight, I have two white young men that are staying, coming from uh, from Orlando. I have two black men that have shown up that have all, they all grew up in my house. I've got a Puerto Rican guy in my house tonight. So I got a house full of people of all colors. And I tell my, my kids, treat everybody equal and you never know who will turn out to be a friend. And these are all lifelong friends of my, one of my sons. And so I say to everybody, treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think you can't go wrong. Be the role model, that's for sure. Maha, what do you what do you think about the advice to young people? Well, I think it depends on what age group we're talking about. So for very young children, I'm a very big storyteller. I believe in books. I think that different cultures, different religions, we should we should try to have people encourage people to publish books about their cultures and have children read them and you know make it an opportunity to learn. Um, the other thing I recommend, not everybody's able to do it, but if you're able to do it, travel with your children. Mm -hmm. um, my kids were always world travelers, and in doing that, they see the beauty in everyone. And it changes your perception of the world, and it makes it such a smaller place. So it's just travel, storytelling, having circles where you can you know, be, be forthright and ask questions, and no question is a bad question. I want you to ask me well, what is a hijab? Why do you wear that? What is it for? What does it mean to you? Don't be afraid to ask the question and to have safe spaces for those discussions. Um, and a lot of it, again, is, is exposure. I, I think Todd spoke of it, um, where just having your kids, like my children, it's like a UN, you know, their, their friends are from all over the world. Even within our family, we have Chinese people, Brazilian people, Puerto Ricans, Cubans. I mean, we've got it all. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
So Great it's thing. just appreciating that and, and, you know, breaking barriers through food is a big thing also. <laughs> yeah, That's perfect. That's a great idea. That's for sure. We had Joan that wrote in a few minutes ago who said host an international student. That's a great yeah. idea too. Yeah. Wow. What, a, what an incredible way to kind of let, let your children experience that if you're able to do it. Josephine, what do you recommend? So, you know, I, I, while we're not there yet, I think we also need to realize that we're at one of the most tolerant points in, in, in time. Our kids are already far more tolerant of so many people than was previously the case. So I think we mustn't look at, lose hope and think this is dire. This is so much better than it ever was in, in history. I hope for truly Martin Luther King's vision that we're all judged by the contents of our character. You know, race is an artificial construct. It's, it's a nonsense. And yet we still define so many people by it. And I think we need to, to take don't judge people surely on this talk about who people are and what their character is and not racializing everything and therefore make assumptions you can't make assumptions about race as we just heard and you can't make assumptions about people's experiences you need to know them you need to know what their story is and and that comes through exposure and willingness to engage that um, and I, what I do hope for the next generation is certainly that they are taught a much fuller history of this country as well. I think uh, that was a very valid point, um, mm -hmm. not to take away the greatness of this country, uh, but if we, it's got to be taught in all its fullness and all its complexity and all its honesty. Um, I think Americans have to deal with their, their historical racism and past. Um, and I think it'll make us a greater country and, and, and one we can all be proud of. So I do hope a fuller teaching of the history would be uh, something our, our children learn. I was really impressed with Dr. Marx's uh, presentation when he was talking about exactly that, that it's not a country of immigrants, it's a country of foreigners. Because if you say immigrants, you're excluding the Native Americans and certainly African Americans who were brought over as slaves. That was a powerful, powerful point. Um, you're going to be able to rewatch this program, by the way, everybody, tomorrow. I'll give you the details in a moment. Maricela, let's wrap up this point. We were talking about hope for the future generations. How do you instill this in young people? I have found that the younger generations are more open than I like have Josephine. that I am. And um, for example, my niece who lives with us um, has for many years, she just strikes me, uh, I, I'm always learning from her. And one of the things that I love about her is that she holds me accountable. She points out some of my biases and as embarrassing and sometimes it can be very difficult as an adult to say you know to explain away something that as I listen to her I, I start thinking you know she's so right um and initially she she called she started calling me out by saying you're so judgy right so of course when she said judgy uh, my reaction was awful right i felt attacked <laughs> and we had a discussion where we sat down and we talked about it and she said well maybe i used the wrong word um but it forced me to analyze what she was saying and i agreed with her um maybe i wasn't necessarily being um as honest mm -hmm. about what we were discussing and kids see that mm -hmm. they are not fooled and mm -hmm. i think that as we grow up we we try to cover certain things behind we we try to explain away what is right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. They, they hold us accountable. Mm -hmm. at, at least um, yep. this generation that I that I'm I'm in contact with, and they they do that a lot, and they're so open. And I'm hopeful for the future because of that. With these, that's kids. fantastic, Tanya. You're raising two beautiful women, and you know what are you what are you you see it from a, a, an aspect like all parents out there, especially at the ages your young ladies are. What do you think about inspiring? 
you know, the young people of, of tomorrow and, or, or learn, continuing to learn from them. Apparently, we probably all are learning from them as well. I think everybody summed it up well, and it's really our actions speak louder than our words. And what we do, our kids imitate more than we care to admit, but they do <laughs> imitate what we do. And, and I think that sets a great example, if we can set a great example. And I think, too, it comes down to the heart. You know what? When you're secure as a person and you're secure as an individual, everyone else you're going to be secure around them too. And you're not going to be feeling like, oh, I'm above you or below you or whatever. So I think it all comes down to the heart and just loving people and being genuine about it. Totally agree. Well, for those of you at home, if you were not able to watch the special tonight, it will be re-aired coming up tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the WPTV app on your favorite streaming device. You'll be able to watch Hidden Bias of Good People. If you missed it tonight, we strongly encourage you. Or if you're watching and you saw it, you think someone else can benefit from it, please let them know. It uh, is impactful, that is for sure. And we want to say thank you so much for joining us on this late evening and for staying up late. I got to get ready to do the news at 11 o'clock. <laughs> but Patrick Franklin, Priscilla Torres, Maha Ekbalawi, and Josephine Gone. Also, Todd Wilson, Tanya Rogers. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And for those of you at home, Great. thanks for sharing thank some you. of your time. And we hope you got a lot out of the program tonight. It's a real credit, in my opinion, to WPTV, but to also our, our parent company, Scripps. We're putting this on in prime time. It's that important to our parent company. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful night, and we'll talk to you again soon. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night, everyone.